Hello runners, this is David McHenry, physical therapist and the director of the Therapeutic Associates Biomechanics Lab. Today we're going to be looking at the first of six installments of Biomechanical Minutes, which is a project where we are looking at six major running injury categories and we're going to identify four and maybe more uh, biomechanical variables that contribute to those tissue overuse injuries. Uh, so the first installment, we're going to be looking at Achilles tendinopathy, and we're going to broaden this a little bit uh, because a lot of the biomechanical variables that we see that are precursors to soft tissue injury also increase the likelihood of tibialis posterior tendinitis or pathology uh, and plantar fasciitis as well. Uh, and then obviously the Achilles tendinitis or Achilles tendinosis uh, falls within this category as well. So the foot and the ankle complex is particularly complicated. We have 26 bones, 33 joints, 19 muscles, 10 tendons, and 107 ligaments. Um, the Achilles tendon is the strongest tendon in the body, and when we're sprinting, it has to be able to absorb uh, up to 11 times our body weight, uh, which is a tremendous amount of force for a relatively small tissue. Um, the feet also have to absorb up to five times of the body weight when we're running, even at a normal pace. And in the normal day, the uh, human foot endures up to about 200 tons of force cumulatively over the course of the day, and that doesn't include running. So complicated, uh, complicated anatomical structure, a lot of tissues, a lot of joints, a lot of muscles, uh, and there's a lot that can incidentally go wrong. So we're going to dive into the biomechanics. And we're going to be looking at a runner that actually has a uh, long-standing history of right side Achilles tendinopathies. And we're going to be looking at four biomechanical variables, and then there's one bonus variable at the end that we're going to touch on. So we're going to first do a little orientation. So uh, within our system, we were able to look at 3D spinal modeling, pressure plate data, and slow motion video analysis from the front, from the back, from the right, and from the left. Uh, today, we're going to be focusing on right lateral view, uh, posterior view, and then a little bit of information in the pressure plate data and our high-speed treadmill, and then the bonus variable is going to be uh, a spinal issue that increases likelihood of low extremity injuries. So we're going to first go to the lateral view. And we'll let this play for a second. Um, and we're going to look first at ankle knee asynchronicity. So we're going to stop our video and we are going to progress this until our runner is at mid stance and how we define mid stance in our biomechanics lab uh, is at peak knee flexion. So if we look down here, we can see that these are the sagittal plane angles of the hip, of the knee, and of the ankle. So we're going to come over and look at the knee flexion and extension angle. And as soon as she is at initial contact, which is right about here, we're going to progress forward until we see that peak knee flexion angle. So she's at 32, 38, then 37. So 38 degrees is peak knee flexion and mid stance. We're going to call that mid stance. And what we're going to look at is how well the knee and the ankle are synchronized. Uh, what we would like to see is as the runner starts to extend out of the knee, uh, he or she also starts to uh, press out of that dorsiflexion angle. So right now the runner is in 38 degrees of knee flexion uh, and she is in 5 degrees of ankle dorsiflexion. So as we progress the study forward one slide, we'll see that the knee flexion angle starts to decrease, which lets us know that she is starting to extend through the knee. We know that she's already extending through the hip. So as soon as she starts to extend through the knee, we would like to see her extend or start to initiate plantar flexion through the ankle. So we're gonna test that theory here. So 38 degrees in the knee, five degrees in the ankle. We're gonna go one slide forward and we see that she is now at 37 degrees in the knee. So she is starting to drive into extension into the backside of her mechanics. However, her ankle dorsiflexion has now gone to eight degrees. So she goes from five to eight. She has gained three degrees of dorsiflexion as uh, she's starting to drive through the knee. And if we progress one more slide forward, she's up to 10 degrees. She's still driving through the knee, 36 degrees, and she's still dorsiflexing through the ankle. We'll go another slide, and we'll see that she is continuing to dorsiflex through the ankle, continuing to extend through the knee. So this asynchronicity in the amount of that dorsiflexion excursion beyond mid-stance is putting a lot of eccentric load through that Achilles tendon. Um, in that eccentric load, uh, repetitively over the course of thousands of foot strikes over, uh, over the duration of a run, uh, can create some cumulative trauma and ultimately lead to some Achilles tendonitis. So this, uh, this asynchronicity is something that we have been seeing uh, that has a relatively high correlation 
to the development of Achilles tendinopathies, tibialis posterior tendinopathies, and plantar fascia uh, irritations as well. So that's our first biomechanical variable that we like to identify. Uh, what we have identified is that this is normally a soleus weakness issue. Uh, we know from some uh, really good research that the soleus has to be able to generate over three and a half times uh, the runner's body weight and strength uh, from uh, like during that mid stance position to help decelerate the tibia and decelerate that ankle dorsal flexion collapse. Um, next, we are going to look at posterior view. So what we are looking at here, we'll look at the left side first. The left side is relatively healthy. There's going to be two variables that we look in this posterior view and we will go to mid stance on this left side. So the two variables that we are going to look at will be the calcaneal orientation and I'll blow this up a little bit so we can see it a little bit better assuming you might be watching on a smaller screen than I'm working with. So the uh, calcaneal bisection is a line right between these two dots and we're looking at the calcaneal orientation in relationship to vertical. And right now the runner is two degrees from vertical so she hasn't gotten to vertical yet which is totally fine. Um, and then the other angle we're going to look at is the Achilles angle. So if we take the calcaneal bisection, a line between those two dots, and then we take the Achilles bisection, which is a line between these two dots, and we look at the angle that those two lines make, we can see that she's only in about three degrees at this point of an Achilles angle. So this all looks really good and, and very healthy. We don't like seeing the calcaneus go beyond zero. Uh, and we don't like seeing the Achilles angle get beyond 10. <clears throat> We've seen that both of those variables start to increase the likelihood of uh, ankle foot tendinosis uh, pathologies, including the tibialis posterior, plantar fascia, and the Achilles tendon. So let's come to the right side and see what happens. On the right side, as she's loading, we can see that she's already up to about negative four degrees beyond vertical. So that's a calcaneal collapse, uh, which is representing some rear foot hypermobility potentially. Uh, and her Achilles angle is all the way up to nine degrees. And we said anything over 10, we start to get concerned about. Um, and if we look at a couple of different strides, and this is another thing that's kind of important, as she goes from mid stance uh, into the propulsive phase, those angles really don't change much. So she's staying in four degrees of a calcaneal collapse, Achilles angle is still at eight degrees, and she really kind of stays in that, that faulty position for quite a while uh, as she's going into the toe off position. So we'll come back to the left side. We'll recognize that things continue to line up really well. Calcaneal position is two degrees uh, from zero, so not beyond zero. Achilles angle is at two degrees as well. Come back to the right side and we'll see the same kind of a, a calcaneal dysfunction and an increased Achilles angle. And every, oh, here we go, we actually get up to 12 degrees. So now as she is transitioning from mid stance towards toe off, uh, in this particular stride, the calcaneal angle is six degrees beyond vertical, so calcaneal collapse. Achilles angle is at 12 degrees. So a fairly significant dysfunction that we know has a relatively high correlation to the development of foot ankle pathology. Uh, the next variable that we're going to look at is the uh, pressure plate data. So this will be our fourth variable, and we're going to have a better view of this when she's running barefoot. So we'll let the study load. And we're going to be looking at pressure plate data. And there are a lot of things that we can look at within this particular view, but we're going to look at the center of pressure. So we're going to come to a slide that allows us to do that. So what this slide allows us to do is it shows us where our runner is making initial contact and then where her average center of pressure travels as she goes from initial contact through mid stance and then from mid stance all the way through toe off. If we come over here to the left, uh, we have a static view of that. And we can see that on the left and the right side, she's landing on the lateral uh, kind of forefoot, which is where a lot of our uh, very accomplished runners make their initial contact. So that looks pretty good. On the left side, her center of pressure travels a little bit medial and anterior, or medial and forward. Um, then we have a little bit of a lateralization, comes back medial, uh, but that center of pressure ultimately travels all the way through uh, the big toe during toe off. What we see on this right side is this posterior deflection of her center of pressure. And what this represents is an excessive amount of dorsiflexion collapse as she's going from initial contact into mid stance. Uh, anytime that we start to see this big posteriorization of our center of pressure or of one of our runner center of pressure, uh, we start to become concerned about soleus weakness uh, and also start to become concerned about soft tissue injuries um, just from the cumulative trauma of running 
uh, with this kind of a biomechanical finding. Okay, so we said that we we're going to give you a bonus uh, variable. So we've already gone through four. We've gone through the knee ankle asynchronicity. We've gone through the rear foot orientation at mid stance and the Achilles ankle uh, uh, Achilles angle at mid stance. And then we just looked at the posterior center of pressure deflection. And the last thing that we're going to look at is actually spine posture. So what we know uh, from some really good research done out of the University of Salford that was published a couple of years ago is that uh, spinal kinematics actually can play a relatively significant um, impact on lower extremity injuries. And what they found was, and we'll come back to the right side, is that at mid stance, so we'll progress this forward to mid stance again, and we're going to use that peak knee flexion during the contact phase to identify mid stance. So 38 degrees is her mid stance knee flexion angle. So what we're going to look at is the amount of forward uh, lean of her trunk. So we're going to come back to the spine view. And there are a lot of different variables that we can look at over here within our data box. Uh, the one that we are going to be looking at, this system refers to as sagittal imbalance or the amount of forward angulation or forward trunk lean of the spine at mid stance. Uh, what they found at the University of Salford is that um, runners that were injured had a sagittal imbalance or a forward lean that was 12 degrees plus or minus 5. So what we do is we think that 17 degrees, if you have close to 17 or over 17 degrees of forward trunk lean at mid stance, that is potentially a problem that could be contributing to soft tissue vulnerability from the pelvis all the way down, including the Achilles. So what we can see here with our runner is that she currently has 16 degrees of a forward trunk lean. Uh, so that is very close to 17, certainly within the range that they found at University of Salford that correlates with uh, increased vulnerability to lower extremity soft tissue injuries. If we come over here to the right, you can see that she gets a maximum of 17 degrees of forward flexion. So that's in that red zone uh, and a minimum of nine degrees with an excursion of about eight degrees. Um, so that is the fifth in the bonus uh, biomechanical finding that we look at that uh, can correlate with increased injury risk in the lower extremity. So that is everything. Uh, five biomechanical uh, variables that significantly increase the likelihood of developing Achilles tendonitis issues. Uh, these are things that are very correctable, but we need to find them to fix them. And the biomechanics lab is one tool that helps us do that. So now that we're done looking at the biomechanics, I want to jump out in front of a couple of questions that I know that we're going to get. First, do shoes help these foot ankle biomechanical dysfunctions? And the answer is yes, but not always. And even if the answer is yes, it doesn't mean that somebody that has biomechanical dysfunction within some of these biomechanical variables that we saw will respond to a structure shoe. Uh, sometimes we see runners come in that have a lot of biomechanical dysfunction in the foot ankle complex, similar to what we saw in our biomechanical review that you just watched. And structured shoes actually make things worse. Uh, and a lot of times they do better in a just a standard pair of low profile shoes. Other times, uh, runners that have some of the biomechanical dysfunctions function very well with a structured shoe. So there isn't a foolproof equation to tell you that a structured pair of shoes is gonna control hypermobility or biomechanical dysfunctions in the foot. Uh, it's not uncommon that we have runners come in, they bring two or three pairs of shoes, we do a side-by-side -side comparison, and we help them figure out what shoe is gonna be best for them. And a lot of times, the shoe that is best for them biomechanically is not the one that they would naturally gravitate towards. We normally gravitate towards shoes that feel comfortable uh, and we gravitate towards shoes that um, feel familiar. Uh, but a lot of times those aren't the best shoes for the runner. Um, so we can help you make that determination. Second question is gonna be, do orthotics help? And it's the same, yes, but not always. Uh, sometimes the orthotics can be a very nice part of the solution, uh, but more often than not, the orthotics aren't the totality of the solution. And we need to find where some of the biomechanical dysfunction is coming from and fix it within your body, in addition to giving you a little bit better architectural support under your foot. Third question is going to be, if I think that I have some biomechanical dysfunction that we saw in the uh, biomechanical review with some of the uh, calcaneal angles being high, the, the uh, calcaneal position, or the Achilles angle being high, the calcaneal position being sloppy, um, and also the uh, foot ankle asynchronicity, do I just need to do foot strength? And the answer is yes, but maybe not. Uh, a lot of times we see runners that come in and they have really good foot ankle strength, but they have a lot of weakness further up in the kinetic chain, and it really becomes a foot problem 
but it is a hip disorder or even a spine disorder. So we need to find it to fix it. That's gonna be something that we keep hitting on over the course of this uh, biomechanical minutes installment. Um, but once we actually find the biomechanical, biomechanical dysfunction, we have to then find out where it's coming from and address that. So the other part of the comprehensive uh, evaluative process is also a clinical evaluation. So once we know biomechanically what's going on, we need to find out why it's going on, and then we address that with corrective exercises, manual therapy, recommendations for shoes, orthotics, or a multitude of other things. So there you go. We're going to wrap up. Hope you enjoyed the first installment of Biomechanical Minutes. Tune in next Monday.